The United Nations Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, represents perhaps the most important legal document guaranteeing full economic, social, and political participation for women in the history of international law. On par with the Civil Rights Act in U.S. constitutional law, CEDAW frames and legitimates international discourse on the rights of women. It provides a topical polis. A critical difference between CEDAW and the U.S. Constitution rests in the gap between rights embodied in CEDAW and legitimate authority of the CEDAW Committee to enforce these rights at the local level. Substantively, CEDAW requires UN member states or parties to CEDAW to take appropriate actions to protect the rights of women as this concerns trafficking, political legal rights, cultural rights, educational, professional, and economic rights, maternity and health care, marriage, and the family. The rights are outlined in 16 articles plus another 14 articles that describe how CEDAW operates. You can find that information on the course site in the folder for week four. CEDAW is a convention or law without enforcement provisions or realistic enforcement provisions. So how does it work? Three factors emerge as essential for understanding the influence of the convention given its limited enforcement provisions. First, the secular international organizational field of the United Nations Human Rights World Society provides an exogenous source of support for the agency of women and women's organizations among both CEDAW state parties and non-state parties. Second, endogenous nation-state cultural and religious factors may align with and fortify or contradict and challenge the object and purpose of CEDAW. Consequently, these endogenous factors influence the orientation of official positions of members of nation states within the secular UN organizational field. Third, written and face-to-face -face oral communication between state party representatives and the CEDAW committee provide a potent social mechanism for changes in the rights of women at the nation state level. The United Nations General Assembly adopted the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women on December 18, 1979, to address specific needs of women not covered in other UN documents, documents which emerged as part of the more general post-World War II international human rights movement. CIRA was entered into force on September 3, 1981, and within the first 10 years, by 2010, 184 nation states became state parties. By 2019, this number increased to 189. Currently, as you can see from this map from the United Nations website, nearly every nation state is a party to CEDAW. The effects of CEDAW depart from the empirical pattern of other United Nations international human rights treaties. For the most part, a proliferation of treaties expanded the body of legislation aimed at increasing respect for human rights. However, the expansion of international law did not result in an equal measure of change in actual human rights conditions among state parties to the treaties. 
By contrast, numerous studies report extensive expansions of women's rights in qualitatively measured outcomes among CEDAW parties. So how does CEDAW work? The expansion of women's rights occurred despite the weak enforcement provisions of the Convention. As noted by Mary, CEDAW is a law without sanctions. Rather, CEDAW and the CEDAW Committee frame and legitimate international discourse on the rights of women. The exchange functions as a mechanism for cultural change at the nation, state, and more local level. Framing through written text and communications around these texts provide social agents with cognitive distancing and emotional reasoning, which they deploy to solve problems and connect with like-minded persons and groups through social interaction around cultural objects that resonate. Cultural objects, such as the United Nations Conventions, work because they resonate. However, they resonate because they work. Cultural objects hear the text draw attention to and reinforce shared beliefs and values through ritualized interaction. Whereas for cultural Whereas for aesthetic cultural objects, there is typically no real ethical sense of right versus wrong. This is less true for international human rights treaties. These result from years of dialogue and consensus on ethical dilemmas across different contexts and diverse rational actors and audiences. Therefore, the process for CEDAW is perhaps more akin to what medievalist Brian Stark referred to as a textual community. Textual communities privilege literate and value rational discourse that may combine with an aesthetic dimension to produce group solidarity and desired ethical outcomes. Stark succinctly summarizes the distinctive features of textual communities. These provide communitarian social spaces where texts are read aloud or silently, and where individuals in groups of listeners can interpret, exchange, and profit from them. Parallel to the Dewey and natural and logical processes of education outlined by MacDonald, new values and normative structures emerge, transform, and supersede the pre-existing tribal or socioeconomic allegiances of economic, of rational actors. Social exchanges within the textual community result in cognitive emotional changes and thus propel the formation of both Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft within the new social configurations. If members institutionalize the emerging norms and structural relationships, they provide capacity for a form of group perpetuation in which rules and not the text transcend pre-existing economic or social bonds. Modifications to the text may become the preserve of specialists. Thus, the idea of text, of text and textual communities gives shape to an emergent layer of hierarchies which privilege education and literacy as part of the normative, rationalizing, or professionalizing processes. This interpretation concurs with the work of Sally Mary, who notes again that CEDA is a law without sanctions that depends on text for cultural meanings. The critical feature is its cultural and educational roles. The preparing of reports and presenting them fosters understanding among participants. Also, non-compliant nations may be shamed in the prestigious 
international arena. Likewise, the influence of the textile community for Sudan and its cultural, educational, and emergent professional wars, roles are borne out by the empirical evidence. By 2019, 7,147 journal articles, 12,567 newspaper articles, 765 book chapters, 395 dissertations had been written on CEDAW since its inception. For a total of 21,645 items on books, conference proceedings, government documents, and other sources are included. The voluminous outpouring of text contrasts sharply with the 139 cases adjudicated by the CEDAW Committee since 1999. Thus, summarizing again, CEDAW is a form of global legality that depends on text, not for enforcement, but for the production of cultural meanings associated with modernity and the international 